Hi everybody and welcome to the latest podcast for Honors Biology at Desert Ridge High School. I'm Mr. Galladay and today we're going to be trying to understand what is a species. Uh, a species has many different uh, different definitions uh, and so we're going to try to understand um, at least one of them, what we call a biological species concept uh, and what that is. Um, most of us are familiar with uh, the sort of common everyday domesticated animals. Uh, so when you look at this, you say, well, there's a cow and a horse, so there's two species. And then we sometimes forget that the humans are a third species. And oh, and that's right, there's those plants. So there's some trees and shrubs back there. So uh, we can easily see probably four or five different species, depending on how many uh, plant species we have in there. Um, so everyday kinds of domesticated plants and animals are pretty easy to tell. Um, now, when we look at these two animals, though, we see that they are very different. And so we might at first say, well, that's two different species of dog. But in fact, all dogs are one species. They are Canis familiaris. Uh, and we have, of course, by selective breeding, uh, we have selected different traits. And they are all uh, from a common ancestor, which originally came from uh, wolves. Um, and so even though these two things look very different, they have a common ancestor in the not too distant past. Uh, and, and so they are uh, one species. Now, you might look at these two birds here and say, well, those look almost identical. Maybe they look, uh, the one on the right is a little bit skinnier and the one on the left is a little bit plumper, uh, but they are, basically, they look like they are one species in terms of their appearance. Well, let's listen to their songs. Okay, there's the bird on the right. Now let's listen to the one on the left. Well, those two songs are different enough uh, to distinguish those two different species. Those are, in fact, two different species. They are two species because they do not interbreed. The song that the male sings is different enough that uh, the eastern meadowlark song, which is the one on the right, uh, will not attract western meadowlark females and vice versa. Uh, so it, while their appearances are virtually identical, it is their behaviors uh, that set them apart. The behaviors are what define them as two different species. Because of those behaviors, they do not interbreed. And since they do not interbreed, they are two different species. Well, if that's not confusing enough, let's look at one more example. Uh, and here we have a population of salamanders that you might see uh, down the coast of Oregon and California. Um, and it turns out that, uh, that when you look at these, you can see that there are some distinct uh, differences between them. And so you might at first think that the, there are uh, one, two, three, four, five, six uh, different species here. But in fact, it turns out that populations one, two, three, and four, even though they look pretty different, uh, they can all successfully interbreed and produce fertile offspring. Uh, and populations four and five can interbreed, and populations five and six can interbreed. Um, so it looks for a minute like there are uh, one species that just all look different. But in fact, if we take population three and we bring them in contact with population six, they will not interbreed. No way, no how. Uh, so, so the question is, is do we have six or do we have one or do we have two? It is a little bit confusing. Uh, this is called a ring species, and uh, this comes to be because of uh, the isolation that has uh, happened between the ones that are on either side of the Sierra Nevada mountains. Um, so this brings us to what we call the biological species concept. And a biological species, uh, and this is species in the plural here, um, species are groups of naturally occurring populations that interbreed uh, but are reproductively isolated from other groups. That is to say that any groups that can uh, naturally interbreed and produce fertile offspring, um, we say are one species. Now, 
we often use the appearance. That, that is to say that when we look up, uh, we use a book to look up butterflies or birds or uh, insects or just about anything, we use the appearance to tell uh, a, a species. But this does in fact cause problems in determining one species from another. We saw a real good example with the meadowlarks. Um, so when does a different population form a new species? Well, there's a process called speciation. Speciation is the process that forms two distinct species from a single ancestral population. Uh, and there are three different requirements that we need to have for speciation to take place. First of all, we need to have something that we call an isolating mechanism. We're going to give you some examples of those in just a minute. We need an isolating mechanism. In addition to that, we need to have different selective for forces acting on the two populations. So that is to say that natural selection is going to be acting in different ways on the two populations because they have something about them is different, whether it is different foods, uh, different disease organisms, different predators, uh, something is happening to cause those two populations to evolve in different ways. And then the third thing that we need is time. Uh, and we are typically talking about geologic time, which is measured typically in millions of years, for those isolated populations to evolve distinct differences which are so great that even if we bring them back in contact with each other, they will not be able to interbreed. Okay, so what are some examples of what do we mean by isolating mechanisms? Well, anything that's a barrier to gene flow is an isolating mechanism. And those generally come into uh, anything that, um, well, this is sort of a negative way to say it, but without an isolating mechanism, we can have uh, closely related populations can still interbreed. But we basically have two different types of isolating mechanisms. Me uh, populations can be isolated geographically, that is to say we have geographic isolation. And then the second is some form of behavioral isolation. They're isolated because of some other form of behavior uh, that keeps them from interbreeding. And we're going to see some examples and uh, details on both of these. Okay, so here's a picture that kind of shows you uh, the difference. Here is, this represents our ancestral population. Uh, and in the example on the left, we have geographic isolation. They are geographically isolated. Uh, so in this case, our, our single lake was somehow divided into two. Uh, and so now these fish were geographically isolated from each other. And over time, they could evolve into two different species. Uh, our example on the right, uh, even though they are still connected in, in one body of water, there is something about the behavior of these fish uh, that causes them so that they do not mate with each other. Whether it's because one mates in shallow water, one mates in deep water, one mates in the early spring, one mates in the late spring, lots of different behavioral things that, uh, that can cause these, uh, these, uh, this population to evolve into two species. Okay, we're going to first look at geographic isolation. And this happens when there's a physical barrier between two populations. A physical barrier, some examples are things like mountain ranges, canyons, oceans, deserts, and so on. These are large geographic uh, barriers. Okay, this isn't just uh, usually something like a river or a creek is generally not enough to form a, uh, a physical barrier. Okay. Um, the example that we saw of the, um, uh, of the salamanders, that is an example of geographic isolation. Uh, in this case, our Oregon population was our uh, founding population. We know this by, D, uh, by DNA evidence. Um, and they have gradually migrated down either coast of the Sierra Nevada. Uh, the, so population three and population six have been isolated from each other for the longest period of time. So you had one population which split. Some went down the eastern coast, or this is the eastern coast over here of the Sierra Nevada. One went down the western coast of the Sierra Nevada. Um, and the, the populations have not come in contact with each other for millions of uh, millions and millions of years. So they so population six and population three have been geographically isolated from each other for a long period of time. Well, how does this work? We start off with a single gene pool. Uh, 
uh, and that single gene pool is divided up by a geographic barrier of some kind. Now this can be uh, because the animals migrate, this can be by individuals being swept off the mainland out to an island, uh, this can be by a geographic barrier like a mountain range or a canyon um, arising or in some way forming between the population, dividing the population into two distinct uh, populations. So now our ancestral population is divided by that geographic barrier. And over a long period of time, differences emerge due, due to either genetic drift or uh, natural selection, which acts because uh, these populations, uh, there are different foods, different predators, different diseases, um, different conditions, different uh, ecological conditions that cause these two populations to evolve in slightly different ways. Over time, those differences become more and more and more distinct for those populations to become successful in their new habitats uh, until now interbreeding is no longer possible where once we had a single population with lots of genetic variation, we now have uh, two populations which are uh, just completely isolated, completely distinct from each other, and they, they will not interbreed even if they come back in contact with each other. Uh, in Arizona, we have a very interesting example of this, which is called um, the Aberts and Kaibab squirrel. Uh, these you can find in, uh, you can find both of these in northern Arizona. Um, Abert squirrel is one that you will find somewhere between five and 6,000 feet of elevation. Anywhere where you would find um, juniper and pinyon pine forest. Uh, so they happen at these sort of intermediate elevations, maybe up as high as 7,000, uh, but right around 6,000 feet, which is the south rim of the Grand Canyon, is roughly the elevation there. Um, so they're common throughout the southwest. You'll see those um, not just uh, up in northern Arizona, but in parts of New Mexico and California and Nevada as well. Now if you go up to the north rim of the Grand Canyon, you might see this little guy. He's a little darker in color. His hair is a little, or, or his tail rather, is a little bit lighter in color. Uh, and you will find them only at higher elevations where you find uh, ponderosa pine. Uh, and particularly this little guy is uh, only found in a, a small area uh, around the north rim of the Grand Canyon. Um, well, what happened? Originally this was one population of squirrels uh, and over the last seven million years uh, something happened. The, um, uh, the, well, the Colorado River cut down into the, uh, the Colorado Plateau as the Colorado Plateau uh, rose around them. Uh, isolating them. So now what we've got are these these uh, squirrel populations are completely cut off from each other. Neither one of them would be able to survive below the rim of the canyon. Um, so you've got the Kaibab squirrel which is uh, uniquely adapted to live in the higher elevations on the north rim and you've got Abert squirrel which is uh, adapted to live in those uh, pinyon pine and juniper forests that you find in uh, the South Rim and also other places throughout the Southwest. So the canyon is now a geographic barrier to gene flow between these two populations. So this is a perfect example of geographic isolation. Okay, well what do we mean by behavioral isolation? Well behavioral isolation occurs when populations do not interbreed because of some behavioral, uh, some form of behavior. Uh, in animals, this can be courtship behavior. In plants, it can be flower timing. Uh, and lots and lots of different examples of this. We'll see a couple. Um, of course, anytime we talk about animals, we know that uh, many species of animals have very complex mating behaviors. Uh, and there are some that are uh, depicted in this little cartoon, including the humans down in the lower right-hand corner. Uh, you might want to pause to see what, figure out what's going on there. Anyway, uh, how does behavioral isolation work? Well, we start off with, again, with an ancestral population. Uh, we have free gene flow within this population. Uh, but now, instead of a geographic barrier uh, forming, you now have some individuals uh, which are uh, 
different than the others. They mate at different times of the year. They have slightly different mating behaviors, uh, or they uh, will mate at different areas, or they hang out in different parts of the habitat. You have lots of insects and birds that will, in, in forest canopies, uh, you don't see the same species up in the top of the trees as you do down at the bottom. Uh, and so individuals that might have a preference for the upper part of the canopy uh, are not going to come in contact with those in the bottom part of the canopy. So over time you get two gene pools that gradually arise and now we have in fact two distinct populations uh, that even though they are not geographically isolated, they are isolated in some way by their behavior. Okay, well we've already seen uh, one example in the, uh, the western and eastern meadowlarks, right? Uh, it was their behavior, their, mate, their courtship behavior uh, by the songs that they sing, the males sing to attract females. Uh, so we've seen, uh, we've seen this example already. Uh, and this is a case where the two populations over, overlap geographically, but they do not interbreed because of their behavior. Okay. Uh, in plants, there, are, there is actually an example uh, here in our area, uh, and this is a species of grass called buffalo grass. Um, and several years ago, people found that they could plant this stuff on soil which was contaminated by uh, mine tailings. So uh, very, very few plants will grow in um, the, the tailings from, uh, from deep mines or, or from strip mining. Uh, but they found that they could plant this buffalo grass there and it would grow. Um, but then what people have recently discovered is that the plants that they're growing on the mine waste um, flower much earlier in the season than the plants growing on uncontaminated soil. So the plants growing on mine waste uh, will flower and, and reproduce very early in the season. So those plants are flowering, uh, they're pollinating each other, um, and they are interbreeding with each other, but they are not interbreeding with nearby plants, even though uh, they are very nearby, uh, the plants growing on that uncontaminated soil uh, do not interbreed with the mine waste plants because these guys are uh, pollinating or are forming flowers much later in the season. So even though they're uh, physically quite close, uh, they do not interbreed because of their flowering behavior. Okay, here's some questions I'd like you to look at uh, for review. Some of these are things that we have talked about in earlier vodcasts. Some of them are things that we have talked about today. Uh, these are all concepts which I feel like are very important for you to understand going forward in this unit. Uh, so please be sure that you pause the vodcast, uh, copy down these questions, and answer these on the left-hand page of your interactive notebook. Uh, thank you for your time. Uh, this is Mr. Galladay for Honors Biology at Desert Ridge High School, and I hope you have a great day.